<laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Scott, and uh, today I have a Pile... What the fuck is this thing called? Pile Power Sequence Controller. It makes a lot of interesting promises, and it has interesting specifications on Amazon, which is why I bought this thing. I'm going to guess, and I'm sure I'm not the first one to ever make this pun, that it is a pile of crap. Just based on looking at it, it actually has reasonable Amazon reviews, because it probably does what it says to an extent, but... Um, I'm wagering it's not all it's cracked up to be, so let's take a look inside. But first, I just want to walk you through this Amazon listing. So it's a 10 outlet power sequencer. Now, a power sequencer means that it turns on usually one outlet at a time. So that, for example, if you have things with a high startup load, or, well, for whatever reason, you just want things to start up in a sequence, it'll, like, turn on channel 1, then channel 2, then channel 3, and so forth, all the way, presumably, through channel 10. And it'll do that, presumably, when you turn the unit on. Now, I haven't looked into exactly how this thing works, but that is my understanding. The very first thing you'll see is that all of the outputs, all the receptacles, are the international multi-connector kind. And those are notoriously, shall we say, dangerous? Um, yeah. And kind of odd that they don't regionalize this product. So, uh, that was my first tip-off that this might be crap. Second tip-off is this random 5-volt USB port. I mean, why? Like, that's just that they can say it has a USB port and really just adds expense to this unit that should otherwise probably be cheaper than this. But we'll find out about that in a few. Another thing that tipped me off to its potential shittiness is the word conditioner. Now, to me, a power conditioner means something that has some kind of filtering or other sort of, like, spike, su suppression, stuff like that. Um, I kind of doubt this has that, but let's see. We'll find out. This is what really caught my eye. 13 amp, 2,000 watts. Now, that doesn't make sense at either 120 or 240 volts, or 230 volts, or any normal household or business voltage I don't know why they're making that claim, especially since this is being sold in North America, because 13 amps should be about 1,500 watts at 120 volts. So I don't know where they're getting the 2,000 figure from. Rack mount, sure, it looks rack mountable. That's, uh, that's good. Pro, we'll see. Audio digital power supply controller regulator with voltage readout. Regulator. Now that would imply to me that if you have an undervoltage or overvoltage, it would compensate for that. I sincerely doubt this does that, but hey, maybe. Uh, voltage readout certainly seems to have that. Surge protector. Well, maybe. Those are cheap and easy enough to implement, so wouldn't be surprised. Um, and home theater stage and studio use. This isn't the kind of product quality-wise I would necessarily use for a stage production. Um, but, you know, we'll see. So scrolling down, it kind of just re uh, repeats what it says. It has... Safety, spike, and surge overload protection. So, and it protects from noise interference, which basic spike and surge protection will not. Uh, voltage fluctuations and electrical surges. I really doubt that part, but again, we shall see. Here's another interesting contradiction. Max power, 2,000 watt outlet, 6,000 watt unit. Uh, maybe at a really high voltage. Uh, I don't know, man. I would not say this is a power conditioner. Well, again, we'll see. Now, two front panel always power outlets. Those are always on, I assume. And the eight rear pa panel power supply outlets, I would wager, are the sequenced ones. Which is kind of misleading because it says 10 outlet power sequencer conditioner. But only eight of those outlets, I guess, are sequenced. So that's, that's just a little sketch. I don't like that. And then you can see the customer reviews are actually pretty good with 115 ratings. So it's probably not all shills. Um, I'm assuming it does what it says to an extent. I'm just uh, thinking it does not have all the features it claims to have. And that, my friends, is what we're here to find out. So let me get this thing open and uh, get to it. Now, first of all, this is probably a customer return because it has additional tape over the original tape. So right away, I mean, that kind of ticks me off because I did buy this thinking it would be brand new, not open box, but you know. Amazon has a tendency to do that a lot. I mean, a lot. Holy crap, that is a thick cord. 
Wow. Um, I mean, first of all, it has a standard 15 amp NEMA plug. So this would be rated for 120 volts at 15 amps, which would be 1850 watts. Uh, but it does give the conductor diameter in metric six millimeters squared. I have no idea offhand what the conversion is. Six millimeters square. Yeah, it says it's 10 gauge. It looks about the thickness of a cable that could have 10 gauge wires inside. I am going to open it up and we'll see for ourselves. But if it is a 10 gauge wire, that's actually kind of impressive. I wonder what the inside is wired like. That's what I'm really curious about. Okay, it comes with a handy little leave a review reminder and, uh, and a one page of instructions, which I'm going to ignore. Okay, I mean, if this was a customer return, it looks fine. Just get that noisy bag out of the way. Okay, looks like it's in good shape. Has a bit more weight to it than I expected, but not as much weight as I expect from a uh, proper power conditioner. Something with like a lot of capacitors and a transformer perhaps inside. So yeah, standard 19 inch rack mount, um, not that deep reasonably enough before I open it up I guess I owe it to them to actually uh, plug it in and test it so um, I'm gonna hold it up and let's see what happens when I plug it into some uh, power okay I hear relays clicking uh, it seems to be sequencing these uh, LEDs in the front and it's saying 118 volts I wonder how accurate that is, 118 volts. And I'm gonna grab a good old Tektronics, old fashioned meter to test this out. And I'm gonna stab my probes into the electrical outlet. Hmm, 118 volts, all right, well enough. So uh, yeah, it seems to work. I'm not gonna bother plugging a whole bunch of crap into it. I'm really just interested to see what's inside. And uh, I did hear relays click, so that's a plus. Not big into manually unscrewing things, so let's just whip these right out and uh, hopefully I can just, yep, punch right through that label. Oh, I'm some kind of idiot. I left this thing plugged in. Wow. Well, that was extremely dumb. Whoo. Oh. And of course. They are um, hex screws. Great. One second. Wow, for the eighth time, the pièce de résistance. Wow, for the ninth time, the pièce de résistance. Oh, wow. That is bare bones. Holy shit. <laughs> All right, so let me walk you through what we have in here. Uh, what we have is <laughs> fairly simple. There is no power conditioning or surge suppression or anything whatsoever. Um, it appears that the power comes in here, goes straight onto the live and neutral terminals. This is labeled neutral, so presumably this long bus bar is neutral. And then live goes on to this pad here and then i'm not sure how that's routed it's probably a double-sided board but we'll see and then there's a ground bus bar here so there's absolutely no filtering power conditioning surge suppression spike protection i mean like this is this is quite literally just false advertising because th this <laughs> connects directly to the outlets and then the outlets in the front are just wired off those same bus bars and come straight here for their always on capabilities so uh yes that is not really a surprise but kind of amusing i guess so the neutral bus bar is the unswitched part it goes straight to one of the pins on the power connectors and the live bus bar is controlled by each of these black relays and each of those black relays is in turn controlled, I guess, through this black ribbon cable, which goes to the front panel, which has a very simple circuit board 
that's hard to see in this shot, but I will uh, provide you with more details on that shortly. And then it appears, so the voltage, the voltage monitor on the front panel right there is just tied onto the uh, bus bars also for live and neutral. So it's a self-contained unit, and I think I've seen these on like Banggood and stuff before. In fact, I might own one. And so interestingly, even though it has like a fairly chunky power switch in the front, that power switch is a soft switch that goes to the front panel circuit board. So these outlets always have neutral and ground connect. Well, ground kind of goes without saying, but always has neutral connected. And I would just be interested to see if this plug is wired properly so that neutral is actually neutral. So uh, let's do this the dangerous way. And I will plug this in, keeping my hands well clear of the inside of this thing. There are better ways to test this, of course, but you know, there are less, there, those are less fun ways. So let me put this on the neutral, or what should be the neutral, because it's unswitched, and just touch that to the ground. All right, good. At least we're not seeing any voltage there. So apparently, then if I monitor between the live and the neutral bus, we get 119 volts. Uh, back to 118. That's fine. That is good. At least uh, the plug is wired correctly such that neutral is actually neutral because this is clearly done in the factory like this is just put on depending on uh, i guess which region this is being sold in and so if this plug was wired incorrectly in the factory let's say by accident that could mean you have uh live going to all these connectors at all times even when you think the unit's off So let's just see, how does this come off? Okay. Yeah, they actually made a reasonable attempt at uh, making this connection solid. I was worried that they were just going to take the bare copper wire or aluminum wire, we'll see, from this cable and just try to screw it onto these terminals. And with 10 gauge wire, that, that would not work very well. Um, but I'm glad to see they actually crimped on connectors and are they ring or are they and yes, I'm using a drill for everything, even this. Yeah, they're ring connectors, not spade connectors for extra, um, for an extra tight connection. So I'm actually pretty pleased with the way this is wired. But again, I mean, they're using red and, and blue as live and neutral. And red is live, which kind of makes sense because it's like the, you know, angrier of the colors. But again, if someone in the factory just got those backwards or... You know, if you've ever wired a plug like this, you know how it depends, like these wires are twisted inside the cable. If you happen to cut this at a certain point, like you want the ground on the bottom and it could be that these two conductors are reversed. And uh, yeah, I just, I don't know how much I trust that, but we got to assume they're, uh, they know what they're doing, right? The relays are labeled arrow speed. Hmm. Arrow speed, T90, 12 volt. A4P, and these are rated at normally closed 30 amps, 240 volts, normally open 40 amps, 240 volts. So at least these have the correct rating. I mean, in fact, with this 10 gauge cable, I mean, this thing could theoretically be rated for 30 amps based on these relays. I don't know if the circuit board can handle that kind of current, but um, I'm at least impressed that this thing looks like it can handle a decent amount of current. Uh, but again, that would depend on how, how good these traces are. And I will test that later, I think, by putting a very heavy load on this, perhaps before I destroy this uh, end connector and the wiring. Oh, and I didn't address this board here. This appears to just be a low voltage power supply for the front board and the USB port. And in fact, let's see how much voltage that's kicking out. So 12 volts going from this power supply to the front panel. And that makes me curious how... Uh, how much voltage regulation is actually on the USB port. I mean, it says five volts. Okay, the USB port is reading 4.985 volts, which is reasonable enough. Um, that's fine with me. I'm, I'm curious how it will perform under load. And now let's switch it back to AC. I just want to really quickly 
check to make sure the ground actually goes through to these plugs. And if it does, then we should get... Oh, well, it'd help if it was on. Then we should be getting 120 volts between live and ground. And we are. That's always a good thing. One thing I don't like about this design is that the ground bus bar is soldered onto the connectors and not in a very robust way like mechanically these solder joints don't look great so i could see this suffering from cracking and possible separation leaving these receptacles ungrounded or at least some of them and certainly an overload overheat condition that's really awful um this solder could melt and then just destroy the ground and in fact you know the um the incoming ground wire is just soldered onto this uh bus bar with a big blob and the chassis ground appears to be this yellow conductor that goes down to a pad on the circuit board which then appears to get screwed into the chassis in fact there is some bare metal on the chassis let's see if like inside one of these screw holes where it's not powder coated if i get continuity between live and ground and we see 120 volts Yes, we do. Okay. So the chassis is grounded. That's always a good thing. I know I could have tested continuity rather than actually running 120 volts through that. But for those of you that perhaps would just prefer to see straight up continuity, I will touch the ground bus bar and there we go. We got 2.3 ohms, but that's close enough to a solid connection for my taste. Now, another thing I'm noticing is that despite the robustness of the incoming power cable, these cables here seem to be very thin. This wire is actually labeled an American gauge and it says 18 gauge. So I'm kind of just gonna assume that that's correct because this looks like 18 gauge wire. In fact, you can see the end of it there. So this is 18 gauge wire, but you have the potential for up to 15 amps being synced by that receptacle, either receptacle in the front, because there is absolutely no overload protection over current protection there's no fuse in here at least not on the mains no circuit breaker nothing of the sort so if there's any kind of short circuit in here or overload condition um these wires would probably just melt in fact it might be fun to later cook a couple of space heaters up to these two uh and do it outside and just see what happens and i disconnected power to it i kind of want to see if these relays are operating normally open or normally closed. And I think the easiest way to test that is just gonna be to remove this connector or this connector, either one, just disconnect the front board. Although it does appear to be glued quite solidly. Hopefully this knife can convince the glue that it uh, shouldn't do its job anymore. So let me just, I might have to do this on the other connector though, if it's glued on the other side, which it probably is. Yeah, cause that doesn't wanna budge. But this one I can actually get to both sides of the connector, so it would help if I was in shot at least somewhat for this. All I'm doing is running my knife along the edge here where it's glued, which will hopefully be enough to release it. Yeah, there we go. I'm not too bothered if I damage the connector anyway, because I'm not gonna be I'm not gonna be in any way using this thing in real life, so. You know, this is kind of just for show and uh, for curiosity's sake. All right, so now let's see if it sequences or if the receptacles just come on. Uh, set it to AC volts. And then... Nope, no power. Okay, so they must be normally open. Which I guess makes sense. I mean, that would be desirable. And they should all click. Oh yeah. Nice and satisfying right there. Now another thing I'm curious about is if they got the polarity reversed on the receptacles. I actually didn't even check that. So, again, let's just see which one is live. So, this one here is live on the left side but this is upside down yeah that is correct okay so i do have the live on the correct side on this that's uh good to know that they didn't screw that up so let me just summarize what we've learned so far compared to what's in the amazon listing 
there is absolutely no filtering, surge, spike, protection, voltage regulation, or any sort of power conditioning. Literally, the input goes straight from the mains, which I should turn off before I go poking around in here, uh, goes straight from the mains to the receptacles on the front and back. So there's absolutely nothing between that except some relays. And relays are not going to do anything that was promised in that listing. What we've also found is that although the circuit board may in fact be rated to supply a full 15 amps because for North America, because this has a 15 amp plug on it, this thing should be able to handle 15 amps end to end. And in fact, I would consider it to be a fire hazard if it doesn't. And I'm going to say that the circuit board, these tracks look pretty thick. I mean, I'm going to guess that they will actually carry 15 amps at 120 volts. Um, but these wires may not do it so well. They may overheat. The insulation may melt. We'll see. The only way to know for sure is by throwing 15 amps through it. A properly rated device at 15 amps should have at least 14 gauge wire. I know wire specifications for panel wiring are, you know, well, it can be a little thinner, but it really depends on whether it melts down in real life or not. And uh, if these solder connections melt and come loose and the wires just sort of go everywhere, that would be interesting too because that could cause a nice short circuit with the case and who knows what else that would do. Uh, that kind of testing I will do outdoors in case it does in fact go aflame. And I will certainly not do it in the middle of the night right now while my wife is sleeping because the smoke detectors will wake her up and she'll be not happy about that. But, like I said, I am curious about the USB connector, so let's see what kind of USB output this thing provides. Okay, so I whipped out my giant uh, heat sink and fan beset uh, load tester, which has USB inputs, and I have hooked it up to the USB output on this device. And that screen is kind of hard to read, but I'm hoping we can muddle through here. And right now I have it set to 100 milliamps. And once I hit the on button, it's going to start drawing 100 uh, milliamps in just a second. And you can see the voltage drop to 4.7 volts off of just 100 milliamps. That is pretty bad. Now if I increase the current a little more, 200 milliamps, we drop to 4.5 volts. 300 milliamps... 4.2, 400 milliamps, 4 volts. I mean, like, 500 milliamps, we're already in a range where, like, most USB devices won't even work. Let's just... Oh, wow. <laughs> the whole thing shut off. You saw the LEDs go out so when, as soon as I, uh... I guess it overloaded the 12-volt power supply that's in there. I'm going to guess that's what happened. Let's try this again. Let's, uh, let me bring it up a little more slowly. We'll start with 400 milliamps. Okay. 500 milliamps. 600 milliamps. 700, yeah, 700 milliamps. It cuts out. That, that is just pathetic. Um, I was actually going to hook up an oscilloscope and see how clean the USB power coming out of this was, but... Um, I kind of don't care. I mean, it's a pretty useless USB port. I guess it would be fine if you had, like, a little LED gooseneck light you wanted to hook up to see, you know, stuff in your rack. As long as it drew less than 700 milliamps, you'd be fine. And it doesn't matter how messy the power is, but, uh, whew, that is, um, not pleasant. And, I mean, the voltage drop, even just getting up to 700 milliamps is, is ridiculous. I mean... You're basically good with maybe like 200 milliamps before the voltage gets too low to run most USB stuff off of. So, um, yeah, as I posited in the beginning, the USB port is just for show. I wouldn't actually rely on using it to charge anything or to uh, power anything unless something charges at a very low current, like 100, 200 milliamps. Then I guess it would be fine. I did put the cover back on, though, for safety with a couple of screws just so that I didn't accidentally go poking in there while it's live. You never know. All right, through the magic of video, it is the next day, and my face is magically shaved, so that's cool, I guess, if you cared. Um, and we're here with our friend The Pile of Crap, 
And it actually isn't as crappy as I thought it would be because I did take it out in the backyard and I tested it at up to 24 amps and it actually did not melt down. The wires got quite hot. In fact, um, yeah, burning to the touch, but the insulation didn't melt and it held together quite well. So let me show you what I did. So here we have the setup. I have a 30 amp power supply coming into this thing, which has NEMA 515Rs for some reason. Um, Really, it's horribly unsafe because this is capable of providing up to about 3,600 watts of power. And uh, yeah, it's got this thing plugged into it, the pile oh crap, and it's going straight through the bus bar. And here I started out by testing out um, the space heaters plugged into the power sequencer ports. And that didn't result in anything significant happening. It got a little warm over here where the, where the live and neutral come in, but uh, nothing too dramatic. So... Then I moved on to testing with the front ports, which are just wired via these 18 gauge cables or these 18 gauge wires rather, which I was hoping would be more dramatic than it was. But you can see here I am pushing about 2650 watts through this thing, which is about 24 amps, give or take. Um, the power meters were a bit hard to see. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can't really make that out too well. So I will zoom and enhanced it as best as possible. So you can actually make out some of the numbers. And I took some thermal image readings of the entire thing. And the actual wiring here got pretty warm. Uh, 118.5 degrees C max right at this solder joint where the live meets the bus bar. And uh, as you can see, the wire itself here is pretty hot, both the live and the neutral. As was the bus bar. I also looked around for the peak amount of heat and I found it right about here at these last couple of relays. And you can see just in this corner, it's 120 degrees C, but it looks like it's about 120 degrees C through all these live connections, which presumably sort of go from one to the other to the other all the way down to here. I'm actually pretty pleased with the whole thing because uh, it did survive. I'm still a little sketched out by having 18 gauge wire for something that could theoretically have, well, up to, I guess, 2400 watts uh, plugged into it if this thing were on a 20 amp circuit and you actually loaded everything on the front receptacles which is fairly unlikely, and uh, like I said, it did survive. That was with the case off. I did test it with the case on, and it didn't melt down there either, but it did get quite a bit hotter, and the uh, wiring got a little bit uh, discolored, actually. The blue isn't quite as vibrant as it used to be. Um, the red's fine, though, and maybe the blue feels just a little bit stiffer than it did before. But uh, no signs of burning, no signs of anything uh, catastrophic happening. So, again, I, I'm honestly surprised um, and pleasantly surprised by this thing. The current handling capacity on the back of, of this thing and the receptacles here, um, I didn't max out a single receptacle, but I maxed out these two, again, at about 2,650 watts between the two of them, and uh, other than some heat on the bus bar, it was all right, you know? So now I figure, let us take a look at each of these circuit boards. Yeah. All right, so I think the best way to attack this rear circuit board, it can't actually be removed completely from this back plate because the receptacles are soldered into the board itself and they're soldered, sort of, the, there are slots cut in the board and then the pins from the receptacles go into those slots. It's very hard to see here. I'm going to put a picture right now of a close-up so you can see that. And when you're putting it together, that would be very easy because you just put the board into position and then blob some solder on each of these. But the solder is going to go down below these uh, pins. And so to desolder it, I would actually have to get underneath the board. So, which is actually possible due to this design because it's got three screws along here. And that should take off this entire back plate, which should liberate the circuit board. And then we can check it out. And it's going to stay soldered to these front receptacles, which I could remove all these connectors here, but uh, I don't know that it'll be necessary since we just need to take a look at the bottom of the board. I don't think the bottom of this board is going to be anything terribly interesting. Okay. Oh, the board also needs to be unscrewed from the chassis itself because there are a couple of screws at this end right there and likewise a couple of screws at this end 
And then I can take this connector out, actually. At least I was able to get it out last night. There we go. And now this board and this whole assembly in the back, actually, is free. And I'm just going to flip it right over. We could take a closer look. So, yeah, along the whole back of this are two bus bars, which are, and the neutral actually looks like it's on the top and the bottom. So there's the neutral, and the live is right below it, and the live comes into this bar right here. Which is kind of a bit awkward because the neutral is actually doubled up on both sides of the board, but the live is not. And so you can see the live kind of proceeds along here, and then it goes to each of the relays here. So the, under the solder mask, there's a little bit of a uh, trace. Well, it's thicker than that. I wouldn't call it a trace because it's pretty damn thick. And then same here, same here, and so forth. It's pretty much uh, identical for each relay. And then the switch side of the relay is this pin here, which if we go over on top, this would be the, where the switch pin of the relay comes up, and then it goes to the input of the receptacle. Then as for the low voltage portion, we can see this is where that connector comes in that I just pulled out from the front board. And it's pretty simple in that each of these just goes to one of the relays, uh, relay magnet terminals. And then from the other terminal, we just come back to a common um, negative or a common positive. I'm actually not sure which, but regardless, the circuit is very simple. It's just this one common connection. It's this pin here that goes up and around, then hits this one, goes up and around, hits this one, and then so forth. And then each of the other pins goes to each of the other relays. So very simple construction. Again, as we can see, absolutely no filtering or conditioning or surge suppression or spike protection on the underside of this board. There's really not much of anything other than these bus bars whose separation really actually isn't all that great. I mean, I'm sure it's fine. It's just, uh, I would say that's about two millimeters right there of separation. So, uh, not horrible, but they do have a cutout there. They do have a cutout where the live and neutral come in, um, but that's about it. So they do look fairly robustly soldered to the board. At least that's good. And then this little power supply board just taps off a neutral connection here and a live connection here, as does this uh, front panel indicator of the uh, voltage. As for this power supply, there's really nothing revolutionary or interesting going on here. It looks like a standard switch mode power supply. Um, it looks like this, this does have some filtering, I suppose. Like uh, the power comes in here and it looks like there's an inductor. It's a filtering capacitor, smoothing capacitor. Um, so, you know, I guess maybe they get around it from a marketing perspective by say, by um, meaning that that tiny little board that does the uh, 12 volts for the front panel and therefore the 5 volts for the USB has filtering and power conditioning. But I believe the marketing material said it conditions and power protects your equipment and protects your equipment. I mean, I guess equipment plugged into the USB socket. Yeah, I'm not buying it either. But I would like to get a closer look at this front board, so let me take that out. I don't think the drill in this case is quite going to work out for me. Eh, actually. You know, when you commit to using the drill, you might as well use the drill. This entire front, this front panel actually does come off just uh, via these screws in the front. But I think in this case, it just makes more sense to take the board out itself. Okay, three screws, and it is liberated. So on this side of the board in the front, it really is not much to look at. It's the USB port and the LEDs, which have these long standoffs. I don't know. Oh, the only re I think the only reason for those long standoffs is so that because of the length of the USB connector, so that when this board is sitting here, the LEDs are just poking out the front, as is the USB connector. 
So the LEDs were flush to the board, the USB connector would stick out quite a bit and that would look weird. So the standoffs in the LEDs and the standoffs in the case here, the entire purpose for those, and actually let me just brighten up this image a little bit. I apologize for uh, having such a dim image. That's much better. And these standoffs in the front, those are all just to accommodate the fairly useless USB port, which in my opinion, they should have just omitted from this product entirely. It's really not necessary at all. But hey, it's, uh, it's another feature you can put on your uh, declaration of what your product is. The product description. All right, I'm just going to take these connectors off so we can take a closer look at the chips on here. I have a feeling it's just going to be a fairly generic microcontroller and uh, maybe some kind of timer chip, but uh, we'll see. It's really a good job they glued all these connections in. I mean, it actually, no, it actually is good. It's just a pain in the ass for me. But it means they're less likely to come loose during shipping or whatever. So can't blame them for this. It's actually a sort of mark of quality that they bothered to glue these connectors in. They're just higher quality locking connectors would probably be better. But hey, there we go. There is the circuit board liberated. So here at the end, we have the 12 volt in. Then the next connector is the switch. It looks like here we have a voltage regulator for USB stuff, along with the capacitor for smoothing, I assume. And the, I think that's a microprocessor, the ULN 2803AG. And is this, oh no, that's, this is probably the microprocessor, the STM, whatever the hell that is. And then on this end of the board, of course, we have the connector that goes to the relays. And if you wanted to see the front of the board close up, well, here it is. Not terribly exciting. Okay, so I looked it up, and the ULN 2803A is a Darlington, Darlington transistor array, which is used to drive the relays. And conveniently, there are eight transistors in this array and eight relays. I'm sure that's not a coincidence. The other package, the STM8S003F3, is indeed a microcontroller. 8-bit, uh, 8 kilobytes flash, 16 megahertz CPU, surprisingly fast for this application, and integrated EEPROM. So, yeah, quite exciting right there. And this is the 20-pin package in this model range. So, yeah, that's the skinny on the circuit board. Uh, if you want close-up pics or whatever, if you want to trace it out, uh, go to s.co.tt slash pile o crap. Yeah, that's what I'll make the URL. Haven't actually made it yet, you know. And like I said, I'm not going to really get into the um, display here in the front because this is just a very generic sort of module that you can buy off Banggood or eBay or anywhere pretty much that just measures voltage off of uh, two inputs that connect conductors that power it and provide, of course, the voltage that it's measuring. Um, not too much else to see, not too much else of interest that we haven't already covered. So thank you for watching. I've been Scott, and um, uh, hang on there, uh, me, I guess. Uh, I have a little bit of an epilogue to this. There's a couple of things I didn't mention in the original video, and I was editing it, and I realized I left this out. One of the things is the plug. And besides the fact that it just looks a little sketchy, um, I did the thing that you're not supposed to do that everyone does, and I pulled the plug out from a receptacle by its cord. And, well, you can see... Yeah, there's uh, no strain relief whatsoever, and there's really not much between you and the conductors internally if uh, this just gets pulled out a little bit. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's quite sketchy, so I'm not too happy about that. The other thing that I wanted to look at was the little switch mode power supply that's in there. Now, I'm not going to go into great depths analyzing it, but I do just want to see one thing, and that is the amount of clearance between the live conductor here particularly, and the chassis itself, because it's soldered from underneath. And uh, I just want to see how much space there is, how much clearance they've allowed there. All right. See, there's some rather thick blobs of solder on there. Not huge. You can see they don't stick down terribly more than any of the other um, contacts under here. But 
There's only about, I would say, from these standoffs, maybe half a centimeter, maybe so five millimeters of clearance. And this seems to be like a good two millimeters, maybe, of solder right there. So it's a bit of a close clearance to the bottom of the chassis. It's not horrible. It's not anything worse than how tight the um, bus bars were on the back. So uh, not awful, but I would like to see a piece of either thick cardboard or plastic between this and the chassis itself because the circuit board was only held on with two screws and if it were to flex or anything like if anything were to get behind there like for example if a screw were to come loose or any standoffs were to come loose because of the welding failed and it was rolling around in there well i mean that would short straight to the board and straight to the case so yeah not ideal but not the worst thing I've ever seen either. Oh, and the other thing I failed to establish was whether there was uh, there were aluminum conductors in this cable or copper. You know what I'm going to do? I'm actually just going to chop the end off this because I would rather replace it with a different plug anyhow. So, uh... And it does certainly look like copper. It also doesn't really look like it's, uh... 10 gauge or 6.2 millimeters squared. Hmm. One second. So this is some wire I got from a uh, reputable supplier. And uh, yeah, the uh, conductors, this is genuine actual 10 gauge wire. And let me focus on that. And you can see these conductors are quite a bit thicker than these conductors. I would say this is more like 12 gauge um, than 10 gauge. So I believe this cable also appears to be something of a lie. Um, as long as that conversion table I found from about 6 millimeters squared to, to gauge was accurate. Um, either way, the thickness of these two cables... on the outside is very similar. So it wouldn't be hard to imagine this is in fact a 10 gauge cable, but uh, yeah, it uh, appears to be more like 12 gauge. So that's interesting, I guess. Anyway, that is all for this video. Thanks for watching. I've been Scott and um, if you like the video, then like the video. That's a weird thing to say, but I guess that's the way it works. And if you subscribe the video, subscribe the video. No, no, that doesn't work. I got to go.